have my drink here. Hmm. Green tea. Nice. I had seen the magic shop from afar several times. I had passed it once or twice. A shop window of alluring little objects. Magic balls, magic hands, wonderful cones, ventriloquist dolls, the material of basket tricks, packs of cards that looked all right, and all that sort of thing. But never had I thought of going in until one day, almost without warning, Jeep hold me by my finger right up to the window, and so conducted myself that there was nothing for it but to go in. I had not thought the place was there, to tell the truth, a modest size frontage in the Regent Street, between the picture shop and the place where the chicks run about, just out of the pair patent incubators, but there it was, sure enough. I had fancied it was down nearer the circus, or round the corner in Oxford Street, or even in Holborn. Anyways, over the way a little inaccessible it had been, with something of a mirage in its position, but here it was now quite indisputably, and the fat end of Jip's pointing finger made a noise upon the glass. Hey, Death. How are things in Tartarus? Hope all is well. If I was rich, said Gip, dabbing a finger at the disappearing egg, I'd buy myself that and that, which was the crying baby, very human, and that, which was a mystery, and called so a neat card asseted by one and astonish your friends. Anything, said Gip will disappear under one of those cones, if I have read it. I have read it in a book. And there, Dada, there is the vanishing halfpenny. Only they've put it in uh, this way up so that we can see how it's done. Gip, dear boy, or Jip, I suppose, inherits his mother's breeding, and so... He did not propose to enter the shop or worry in any way, only you know quite unconsciously he lugged my finger downwards, and he made his interest clear. That, he said, and pointed to the magic bottle. If you had that, I said, at which promising inquiry he looked up with a sudden radiance. I could show it to Jesse, he said, thoughtful as ever of others. It is less than a hundred days to your birthday, Gibbe Gibbles. <laughs> Gibbles, I said, and I lay my hand on the door handle. Gip made no answer, but his grip tightened on my finger, and so we came into the shop. It was no common shop, this. It was a magic shop, and all the prancing preceded Gip would have taken in the manner of mere toys he wanted. He left the burthen, burthen of conversation to me. It was a little narrow shop, not very well lit, and the doorbell pinged again with a plaintive note as we closed it behind us. For a moment or so, we were alone and could glance about us. There was a tiger in paper mache on the glass case that covered the low counter and gave a kind eye tiger that waggled his head in a methodical manner. There were several crystal spheres, a china hand holding magic cards, a stock of magic fish bowls in various sizes, and a immodest magic hat that shamelessly displayed springs. On the floor there were magic mirrors, one to draw you out long and thin, and one to swell your head and vanish your legs, and one to make you short and fat like a drought. And while we were laughing at these, the shopman, as I suppose, came in. At any rate, he was behind the counter, a curious, shallow, dark man, 
with one ear larger than the other and the chin like a toe cap of a boot. What can we have the pleasure? He said, springing his long magic fingers on the glass case, and so at a start we were aware of him. I want, I said, to buy my little boy a few simple tricks. Uh, I don't know what that word is. <laughs> Ledger domain. Mechanical, domestic. Let's, <laughs> let's look that one up. Skill of one hands while performing conjuring tricks. Ah, I know the Romanian word for this one. Cool. Ledger domain. It's uh, Presti. Isn't it Presti Digitation as well? Hmm. Ledger domain. Ledger domain. Interesting. Ledger domain, he asked. Mechanical, domestic. Mm -hmm. Anything amusing, I said. Mm, said the shopkeeper, scratched his head for a moment as if thinking. Then, quite distinctly, he drew from his head a glass ball. Something in this way, he said, and held it out. The action was unexpected. I had seen the trick done and entertainments endless times before. It was part of a common stock of conjuries, but I have never ex not expected it here. That's good, I said, with a laugh. Isn't it? said the shopman. Jip stretched his disregarded hand to take his object and found a merely blank palm. It's in your pocket, said the shopman, and there it was. How much will it be? I asked. We make no charge for the glass balls, said the shopman politely. We get them, he picked one out of his elbow and spoke, free. He produced another from the back of his neck and laid it beside its predecessor on the counter. Gip regarded it with glass, the glass ball sagely and directed a look of inquiry to the two on the counter and finally brought his round eye scrutiny to the shopman who smiled. You may have those two, said the shopman, and if you don't mind one, from my mouth. So, Gip <laughs> counseled me mutely for a moment, and then in a profound silence put away the four bowls, resumed my reassuring finger, and nerved himself for the next event. We get all our smaller tricks in this way, remarked the shopman. I laughed in a manner of the of one who subscribes to a jest. Instead of going to the wholesale shop, I said, of course, it's cheaper. <laughs> in a way, the shopman said, though we pay in the end, but not so heavy as people suppose, our larger tricks and our daily provisions and all the other things we want, we get out of that hat. There isn't a whole sh wholesale shop not for genuine magic goods, sir. I don't know if you noticed our inscription, the genuine magic shop. He drew a business card from his check and handed it to me. Genuine, he said, with his finger on the word and added, there is absolutely no deception, sir. He seemed to be carrying out the joke pretty thoroughly, I thought. I turned to Gip with a smile of remarkable affability. You, you know, you are the right sort of a boy. And I was supposed at his knowing that, because in the interest of discipline we keep it rather a secret even at home, but Gip received it in an unflinching silence, keeping a steadfast eye on him. It is only the right sort of boy gets through that doorway, and... As if by way of illustration, here came a rattling at the door, and a squeaking little voice could be faintly heard. Nayar, I want to go in there. Dada, I want to go in there. 
No! And then the accents, downtrodden parent, urgent consolation and propitations. It's locked, Edward, he said. But it isn't, said I. It is, sir, said the shopman. Always for that sort of child. And as he spoke, he lay, he had a glimpse of the other youngster, a little white face, pallid, from sweet eating and over sapid food, and distorted by evil passions, a ruthless little egotist, pawing at the enchanted pane. It's not good, sir, said the shopman, as I motioned with a natural helpfulness downwards, and presently the spoiled child was carried off howling. How did you manage that? I said, breathing a little more freely. Magic, said the shopman, with a careless wave of his hand, and behold, sparks of coloured fire flew out of his fingers and vanished into the shadows of the shop. You were saying, he said, addressing himself to Jip, before you came in, that uh, you would like one of one to buy, buy one and astonish your friend's boxes? Gip, after a gallant effort, said yes, it's in your pocket. And leaned over the counter, he really had an extraordinary long body. This amazing person produced the article in the customary conjurer's manner. Paper, he said, and took a sheet out of the empty hat with the springs. Spring, and behold, his mouth was a spring box from which he drew a unwielding thread, which then he had tied his parcel, he bit off, and it seemed to me swallowed the ball of string. And then he lit a candle at the nose of one of the ventriloquist's dummies, stuck one of his fingers, which had become sealed wax red, into the flame, and so sealed the parcel. Then there was the disappearing egg, he remarked and produced one from within its coat breast, and packed it, and also the crying baby, very human. I handed each parcel to Gip as it was ready. He clasped them to his chest. He said very little, but his eyes was eloquent. The clutch of his arms were eloquent. He was the, pl uh, he was the playground of unspeakable emotions. There, you know, they are real magics. Then, would I start? Ooh, we are still alive, yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, then, with a start, I discovered something moving about my hat. Something soft and jumpy. I wiped it off and ruffled pigeon. A ruffled pigeon, no doubt a confederate, dropped out and ran out of the corner and went, I fancy, into a cupboard box behind the papier-mâché tiger. Tut tut, said the shopman, dexterously retrieving it. One of my headdress, careless bird, and I live nesting. He took out my hat and shook out in its excited hand two or three eggs, a large marble, a watch, about half a dozen of the invariable glass balls, and then crumpled, crinkled the paper more and more and more, taking all the time of the way in which people neglect to brush their hats inside as well as out, politely of course, but with a certain personal application. All sorts of things accumulate, sir. Not you, of course, in particular. Nearly every customer. Astonishing that they carry about with them. He crumpled the paper rose and billowed out uh, the corner more and more and more until he was nearly hidden from us, until he was altogether hidden, and still his voice went on and on. We, none of us, know what the affair symbol of a human being may conceal, sir, and we all then know better than brushed exteriors, whited satchels. Uh, satchels? Hmm. Don't know that word. Let's see. Doesn't seem to be satchels. Ah, small room. Cut in rock or built in stone, in which a dead person is laid. Sepulchre. Sepulchre. Ah. 
Sepulcher. Sepulcher. Interesting. A sepulcher. His voice stopped exactly. Like when you hit a neighbor's gramophone with a well-aimed brick. The same instant silence, and then the rustle of a paper stopped, and everything was still. Have you done with my hat? I said after an interval. There was no answer. I stared at Jip. Jip stared at me. There were odd distortions in magic mirrors, looking very rum and grave and quiet. I think I'll go now, I said. Will you tell me how much all this comes to? I say, I said, on a rather louder note, I want the bell on my hat, please. And my hat. <laughs> I might have been a bit stiff from behind the paper pile. Let us look behind the counter, Gip, I said. He's making fun of us. I led Gip round the uh, head-wearing tiger. And what do you think there was behind the counter? No one at all, only my hat on the floor, and a common conjurer's lop-eared white rabbit lost in meditation, and looking as stupid and as crumpled as only a conjurer's rabbit can do. I resumed my hat, and the rabbit lopped, lopped a lop, or out of my way. Da da, said Gip in a guilty whisper. What is it, Gip? I said. I do like this shop, da da. Should I? I said to myself. In the counter wouldn't really suddenly extend itself to shut one off from the door. But I didn't call Gibbs' attention to that. Pussy, he said. What? <laughs> With a hand out to the rabbit and it come lopping past us. Pussy! Go Gip! Do Gip a magic! <laughs> okay. And his eyes followed it as it squeezed through a door I had certainly not remarked a monument before. Then this door opened wider, and a man with one ear larger than the other appeared again. He was smiling still. His eye met mine with something between amusement and defiance. You would like to see our showroom, sir? he said, with an innocent suavity. Gipped tugged my finger forward. I glanced at the counter and met the shopman's eyes again. I was beginning to think the magic just a little too genuine. We haven't really much time, I said. But somehow we were inside the shop room before I could finish that. All goods of the same quality, said the shopman, rubbing his flexible hands together. And that is the best. Nothing in this place that isn't genuine magic. And warranted fruly rum. Furly rum. Excuse me, sir. I felt him pull at something that clung to my coat sleeve, and then I saw he held a little raggling red demon by his tail. The little creature bit and fought and tried to get his hand, and at a moment he tossed it carelessly behind the counter. No doubt the thing was only an imagine of twisted uh, India rubber, but for the moment his gesture was exactly that of a man who handles some pretty biting bit of vermin. I glanced at Gip, but Gip was looking at a magic rocking horse. I was glad he hadn't seen the thing, I said. Ah, uh, I said in a undertone that indicating Gip and uh, the red demon with my eyes. You haven't many things like that about, have you? None of yours. Probably bought it in with you. None of ours. Probably brought it in with you, said the shopman, about in an undertone and with a more dazzling smile than ever, astonishing that what people will carry about with them unawares. And then to Gip, do you see anything you fancy here? There were many things that Gip fancied there. He turned to his astonishment tradesman with a mingled confidence and respect. Is that a magic sword, he said? A magic toy sword. It neither bends, breaks, nor cuts the fingers. It renders the bearer invincible in battle against anyone under eighteen. Half a crown to seven pence, according to size. These panoplies of cards are the juvenile knights errant and very useful. Shield of safety, sandals of swiftness, helmet of invisibility. 
Oh, Dada, gasped Gip. I tried to find out what they cost, but the shopman did not heed me. He got Gip now. He had got him away from my finger. He had embarked upon the exploration of all his confined stock, and nothing was going to stop him. Presently, I saw with a qualm of disgust, and something very like jealousy that Gip had to hold on the person's finger as unusual as he was holding off mine. No doubt the fellow was interesting, I thought. I wandered after them, saying very little, but keeping an eye on the prestidigital Ah, oh, maybe we use the prestidigital thing. On oh, this prestidigital fellow. After all, Gip was enjoying it. And no doubt when the time came to go, we should be able to go quite easily. It was a long rambling place. The showroom, a gallery broken up by stands and stalls and pillars, with archways leading off to another department, in which the queerest-looking assistant lofted and stared at one, with the perplexing mirrors and curtains. So perplexing, indeed, were these, that I was presently uh, unable to make out the door by which we came on. The shopman showed Gip magic trains that ran without steam or clockwork. Just as you set the signals, and then some very, very valuable boxes of soldiers, all came alive directly. You took off the lid and said, I myself haven't had a very quick ear, and it was a tongue-twisting sound, but Gip, he who has his mother's ears, got it in no time. Bravo, said the shopman, pulling the man back into the box, unceremoniously, and handing it to Gip. Now, said the shopkeep, and in a moment Gip had made them all alive again. Will you take the box? I asked the shopman. We'll take that box, said I, unless you charge it in full value, in which case I need a trust magnet. Dear heart, no! The shopman swept the little man behind again, shut the lid, waved the box in the air, and there it in, in was, a brown paper tied up and with Gibbs' full name and address on the paper. The shopman laughed at my amazement. There is genuine magic, he said, the real thing. It is a little too genuine for my taste, I said again. After that he fell to showing Gip tricks, odd tricks, and still order the way they were done. He explained them, he turned them inside out, and there was the dear little old chap nodding his busy bit off the head in the sagest manner. I did not attend at well, as well as I might. Hey, presto, said the magic shopman. And then uh, would come uh, the clear, small, hey, presto, uh, of the boy. But I was distracted by other things. It was being born in uh, about me just how tremendously rum this place was. It's a weird way to say things. Tremendously rum. I had no idea that the rum is used in another way. I thought it was just a drink. Tremendously rum. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. So it's the spirits. Or the 17th century abbreviation of absolute Rambullion. <laughs> awesome. A Rambullion. <laughs> ah. Odd or peculiar. Interesting. <laughs> the uses has been going down. Of Ram as Ram Bullion. <laughs> there could also be a drink. Ram Bullion. Isn't Bullion a drink? Ooh, look at those pretty clouds. If I would cut this... That little part and sped it up, you would see them moving... Like steam in the air. Hmm. Might just do that with a recording.
Where were we? Ah, yes. Tremendous Rum. Cloud Cam. Oh, aren't they beautiful? They're awesome. They're always... I used to do stop motion... Um, I don't know if it's animation. I did a bit of stop motion animation and I used to be fascinated with uh, stop uh, stop timer cameras. And I would put uh, one of these stop camera timer cameras on a sandy beach, uh, point them at a at a cliff with some clouds, and then I would get home and you know it was like a picture every minute or something. And you would see it like an animation, you know? Uh, a couple of hours in... A couple of... in one minute or something less. Pretty cool. Where the hell were we? Tremulously rummy! <laughs> it was, so to speak, inundated. By a sense of rumminess. Ah, rumminess. There was something a little rum about the fixtures, even. <laughs> I'm going to take this. <laughs> Inundated with a sense of rumminess. I like the way it sounds. There was something a little rum about the fixtures even. About the ceiling. About the floor. About the casually distributed chairs. I had a queer feeling that wherever I wasn't looking at them straight... They went askew and moved about and played a noiseless, a noiseless puss in the chair in the in the corner behind my back. And the corniche had a serpentine design with masks, masks altogether too expensive for proper plaster. Hmm. Then abruptly, my attention was caught by one of the odd-looking assistants. He was some way off and evidently unaware of my presence. I saw a sort of three-quarter length of him over a pile of toys and through an arch. And, you know, he was leaning against a pillar in an idle sort of way, doing the most horrid things with its features. The peculiar horrid thing he was doing was to his nose. He did it just as though he was idle and wanted to amuse himself. First of all, it was a short, bloody nose. Blobby. <laughs> blobby nose. Oh, Dobby. Dobby the blobby. Dobby with a blobby nose. And then suddenly he shot it out like a telescope. And then out it flew and became thinner and thinner, until it was like a long, red, flexible whip. Like a thing in a nightmare it was. He flourished it about and flung it forth, as a fly fisher flings his line. My instant thought was that Gip mustn't see him. I turned about, and there was Gip, quite preoccupied with the shopman, thinking no evil. They were whispering together and looking at me. Gip was standing on the little stool, and the shopman was holding a sort of big drum in his hand. Hide and seek, Dada, cried Gip. You are he. You are he. Okay, so that's how you do it. You are he. And before I could do anything to prevent it, the shopman had clapped his big drum over him. I saw that it was directly. Take that off, I cried. This instant. You'll frighten the boy. Take it off. The shopman, with unequal ears, did so without a word, and held the big cylinder towards me to show its emptiness. And the little stool was vacant. In that instant my boy was utterly disappeared. You know, perhaps, that sinister something that comes like a hand out of an unseen and grips your heart about. You know, it takes you uncommon self away, your common self away, and leaves you tense and deliberate. Neither slow nor hasty, neither angry nor afraid. So it was with me. I came up to this grinding, grinning shopman and kicked the stool aside. Stop this folly, I said. Where is my boy? You see, he said, still displaying the drum's interior, there is no deception. I put my hand to grip him, and he eluded me by a dexterous movement. It's na I, I snatched again, and he turned from me and pushed open a door to escape. Stop, I said, and he laughed, receding. I leapt after him into the utter darkness.
Thud. Lord bless my heart. I didn't see you coming, sir. It was, I was in Regent Street. I had collided with a decent looking walking man. And, a yard away perhaps, and looking a little perplexed with himself, was Gip. There was some sort of apology, and then Gip had turned and come to me with a bright little smile, as though for a moment he had missed me. He was carrying four parcels in his arm. He secured immediate possession of my finger. For the second, I was rather at a loss. I stared around to see the door of the magic shop, and behold, there was none. There was no door, there was no shop, nothing. Only the common pilaster between the shop where they sell pictures and the window with the chicks. I did the only thing possible in this mental tumult. I walked straight to the key stone and held up my umbrella for a cab. Well, so that's how I hail a, hail a cab. With an umbrella. And some, said Gip, in a note of culminating exultation. I helped him in, recalled my address, and with an effort, and got in also. Something unusual proclaimed itself in my tailcoat pocket. I felt and discovered a glass ball. With a pertulent expression, I flung it into the street. Gip said nothing. For a space, neither of us spoke. Dada, said Gip, at last, that was a proper shop. I came round that to the problem of just how the whole thing had seemed to him. He looked completely undamaged. So far, so good. He was neither scared nor unhinged. He was simply tremendously satisfied with the afternoon's entertainment. And there, in his arms, were four parcels. Confound it! What could be in them? Hmm, I said. Little boys can't go to shops like that every day. He received this and his usual stoicism, and for a moment I was sorry, and I was his father and not his mother, and so couldn't suddenly come there, coram publico, in our handsome kiss him. Okay. Coram publico. This. This reminds me of our little fellow. Cornelius Publio. <laughs> <laughs> Scipio shall play him, maybe. After all, I thought the thing wasn't very bad. And it was only then we opened the parcels that I really began to be reassured. Three of them contained boxes of soldiers, quite ordinary leap soldiers, but of so good quality as to make Gip altogether forget the originally these parcels had been magic tricks and the only genuine sort. And the fourth contained a kitten, a little live l white kitten, in excellent health and appetite and temper. I saw this unpacking with a sort of provincial relief. I hung about in the nursery for quite a while, an unquestionable time. That happened six months ago, and now I am beginning to believe it was all right. The kitten had only the magic natural of all kittens and the soldiers seemed a steady a company as any colonel would desire. And Gip, the intelligent parent, will understand that I have got to go cautiously with Gip. But I went so far as this one day, I said, How would you like your soldiers to come alive, Gip, and march about by themselves? Mine do, said Gip. I just have to say a word, and I know before I open the lid. Then they march about alone? Oh, quite, Papa. I shouldn't like them if they didn't do that. I displayed no unbecoming surprise, and since then I have taken occasion to drop in about him once or twice unannounced. Then the soldiers were about. But so far I have never discovered them performing in anything like a magical manner. It is so difficult to tell. There is always a question of finance. I have in an incurable habit of paying bills. <laughs> yeah, I do too. If I don't pay the bills, there is also an incurable habit of them cutting the cutting current. 
having no... Nope, so I guess it finished. Having no... No internet, no water and stuff. It's... <laughs> I have been up and down Regent Street several times looking for that shop. And I am inclined to think, indeed, that in that manner, honor is satisfied, and that, since Gibbs' names and address are known to them, I may very well leave it to these people, whomever they may be, to send in their bill in their own time. So I guess he never actually uh, ended up paying. <laughs> and that's the end of the story, because... The next one is the Empire of Ants. Quite interesting. I liked it. It's a child's play, but uh, I liked it. A magic shop that disappeared after you shop in it. And it only lets in the magic people. Not the moguls, or whatever they're called. Muggles? Yeah. <laughs> 